Welcome to Dakota Starry Nights. I'm Richard Walker, producer, and this daub is big enough to hide behind, but it's light enough to carry. It is well made, all metal construction and glass. And what I have here is a Hubble Optic UL16 ultra lightweight Dobsonian mounted telescope. This is a real different kind of setup here. It fits in the back of my SUV with ease. Now with all Dobbs, I had to make a couple of little tweaks, but nothing major. This has been the easiest one to put together, and I'm very pleased with it. Now where we're at right now is in western South Dakota, just east of the Black Hills, out here in this open field, this beautiful country here. I'm waiting for the sun to go down. So this is first light. But if the optics is anything as good as the mechanics and the fit and finish on this scope, it's going to be a real winner. And one of the most outstanding features is its light weight, 60 pounds total. And when you compare that to the traditional Dobsonian telescopes that come in over 100 pounds or more, this is a snap to carry. I just unloaded it from the car and dropped it right in place. I've devised a little special strap that gives me a little extra support and if you keep your back straight it's a breeze. Hard to beat it. One of the main selling features for me on this Dobsonian telescope was the sandwich mirror design. It's really unique and allows a large aperture scope like this which normally takes quite a while to acclimate to your ambient temperature, cool down a lot faster. So that's a real winner. Plus it cuts a lot of weight off the mirror. Now the mirror on paper weighs 25 pounds. That's pretty light for 16 inches of aperture. And although I didn't weigh it, I could easily hold it out in front of me without no problem, no stress, no strain. So it really does cut down on the weight. But like anything, we've got to see what the optics are going to perform like. Now this evening, there's going to be a full moon coming up around 9.30 or so, so I'll only have just about a half hour, 40 minutes with this scope this evening. But I intend to take it out several more times and run it through its paces. So the sun's going down almost behind the Black Hills there, so let's run over to the shop and check out the unboxing and inspection, and then after that we'll come right back here and we'll be doing some visual and uh, give you a report on what I see for first light. Stay tuned. All right, so this just arrived, the Hubble UL16 Ultralight. Now this is where the poles come, so you get three boxes, guys. And it came relatively quick when there's a two month waiting period for them to uh, get it built. I imagine they're putting these together onesie twosies and which is not a bad thing. Uh, take obsession for instance. There's waiting lists for that. You know you have to wait and put your order in. So this is not unusual that a guy has to wait for it. And depending on what shipping method you choose will determine how long it takes to get here. Uh, this looks fine by the way. I don't see any problem here. Of course this is all bundled nice. He did a great job putting this together. So this is powder coated. It has a little gloss to it so it's not completely flat. It's very similar to the Explorer Scientific Ultra Lightweight because they have a little gloss on theirs. Now this scope has been out a while since like I think it first got introduced in 2011, and the original release, uh, like a lot of these things, you know, had some problems uh, that needed to be sorted out. What you're looking at here is the latest with the different improvements that were made. Okay, so there are the poles. So it's got different holes here. Uh, for depending on what focal length your scope is. This is the f4.5. 
So from what I understand, you put it in the middle. And then this, this goes to the, the top, I believe, and then this is the bottom. Looking good. I'm going to put these off to the side, guys. Get some room. Here's the mirror box. The meat and potatoes of it. And I can lift it. It's not crazy heavy. This is a, a cell mirror. So it has two advantages over the traditional solid mirror. One, it's lighter. And two, it cools quicker. And one of the things about these large aperture telescopes that is a real factor, and sometimes guys don't take it into consideration, cool down time. How does your temperature swing? Does it swing a lot? Is it a little? Because if it has the ability to acclimate quickly, then you're able to keep up with it. And if, you don't, if your optics are not properly acclimated to the ambient temperature, you're not going to get the top performance out of the instrument. It's one of the drawbacks with the larger apertures is that they tend, in the traditional mirrors, tend to take a while to really get right. And uh, so they don't really perform sometimes as well as some people expect. My communication with uh, Hubble Optics has been really good. I got questions answered really pretty quickly. And the whole transaction, the money-wise and all that, went pretty uh, smooth. No, no complaints. Okay, right here. This is the upper part of the cage. Now, originally, the secondaries, from what I understand, you had to glue the mirror onto the secondary on the original iteration, but not anymore. So here's the upper part of the secondary cage. This has been welded right here. This looks pretty nice. The screws look to be stainless steel, guys. That's what it looks like to me. So it looks like they welded the front here, ground it off, okay, and then tacked the upper part here. And they also ground the inside. I'm running my hands across here and I don't feel any sharp edges at all. So that was nicely done. All right, and here's the shroud. You definitely want that. See what we got here. It's wrapped pretty good. Ah, the focuser. Okay, so here's the focuser. It's a bull bearing, lintel bearing. There's the brake here. Now, you see the silver part? This is a grounded plate, and it's raised. I could put my fingernail there, and it's raised. Normally, when, I've seen, when you find these Crayfords like this, they don't put a plate here. Normally, what they do, those ball bearings just ride on the, the tube out here. They don't have a surface that has been milled in order to allow the bearing to ride. Now I like that because what that's doing is it's creating a flat surface. So that bearing, it has more of a surface to ride on. Yeah, I'm looking at it here. Now normally you always see that. And if it's a, a rack and pinion, this would be where the rack is. But on this one it's smooth so there's no rack. It's just a, a linear bearing system. But uh, yeah, nice focuser. I like it. And here's something else on the side. I think this is a support for the altitude bearings. And I believe that's what that is. And you know, a lot of guys are going to these lighter ones because what happens is you get those big conventional daubs and the aperture is great, but then you run into weight problems and then all of a sudden after, you know, half a dozen times of dealing with that weight and all of that and you start to come up with reasons why maybe it's not a good night to set up and that's not a good thing and here's the well the wells look good yeah these are nice and nicely cleaned up excellent finish can't complain on that a lot of times you see these things and they're just tacked on but, uh, what I see here these, this, this, these are complete wells so that's the bottom, and the legs get attached to that. 
Now there were some uh, complaints about the azimuth not working properly, being too smooth, running all over the place. And what they've done is they put this brake on here. And that's the brake. That's it there. And so you adjust the tension by loosening this Allen head screw, okay, and that adjusts the bearing. And here's the bearing. Now, first time I'm looking at this, nobody's ever pointed this out, but this is the this is the inner ring and this is the the racer that it races. Now, right in here, and I don't know if you could see it, there's ball bearings and they're like butt to butt. It's completely supported with ball bearing, and that's how it rotates. And so then you tighten it up with this. There is a, a PDF file that you can download from uh, Hubble Optics that explains on how to put this together. So, you haven't seen a whole lot of guys buying this, and I think part of the problem is because the initial release had some issues, but don't they all, in my experience. There was a, a video of this at a NEEF several years ago, and but there wasn't much detail on it. It was just it was already assembled and they had it there, and it was the earlier version too. This is the mirror box right here. Okay, there this this what holds the mirror in place. This is uh swings around, it's it's off center, and that's in order to adjust it. There's one, two, three, four, five, six points to support it, and this is stainless steel. Jeez, I like that. So here is the the bearing. Now this looks like uh, this is Formica, a black thin Formica that has been glued on there with contact cement. This feels pretty robust. We're looking at a solid piece of aluminum that's probably been cut out of aluminum plate. And here's the second part right here. This was the real bugger. I mean, there was uh, quite a few guys complaining about this, and one European dealer that said that this was a real uh, issue, and that until it got resolved, uh, he felt like he didn't want to be selling these. Now remember, that's these that was early, okay? And so we're hoping that this stuff got resolved. Okay? I don't see any tools for putting this together, but you know what? <laughs> as many tools as I have, I don't need them. I'd rather him, you know, put the money somewhere else instead of providing tools that are not necessary. Now, I've got that snugged up. I'm not sure how the original ones were, but hopefully they got that resolved. Because I could see how that could be a real issue. All right, so now there is a little bit of play right there. Yep, a little bit of play there. So I got a little lip. So apparently there is some kind of slight adjustment here. The whole idea of this split bearing is for portability. It's not going to be an automatic lock type thing from what I could see. I'm thinking the best way to really deal with that for tightening it up so what I'm thinking is put it on the bearing, okay, and then tighten it up, putting pressure on it, making it match, and then let's see if that, just going to snug it. Okay, that seemed to have gotten it. And that's a pretty easy fix for that. You know, for me, uh, daubs are kind of like uh, hot rods of telescopes. You know, you soup them up, trick them out. You know, I don't mind tricking them out, making them a little bit better, as long as the materials are of good quality and the workmanship is of good quality. So far, from what I've seen here, the materials and the workmanship, this is a little bit above average, okay, or maybe even a lot above average when you consider it's an ultralight. An average weighs a ton, right? And it's full of particle board. There's no particle board here. All I've seen was stainless steel and aluminum welded. That's it. 
So here's the whole mirror. And look, I can hold it out in front of me. 16. I can feel the sandwich. Here's the back of it. And you see the cells? These are like uh, pieces of glass. They're cells. They're solid, it looks like to me. And that allows you the two cell. And here, here is the sandwich, you see. That's the sandwich in there. And that lets air come through there and lets this cool down. It also cuts away all of that weight. It removes all that material. Now, the edges have been ground off. They beveled it a little bit. And they beveled it up here. And there is a center spot from what I could see. I'll show you this here. That's it there on the back side. Mm. Well, there it is. Now this is edged really nice. It's got a nice edge to it. You know, it's been ground off really nice. I see what looks like a, a streak left behind from cleaning, maybe. This is a special optical tissue. Kimtech. Well... You know, I'm wondering if that's not a micro scratch left by the grinding process. I'm not real sure. Yeah, you know, I think it is. I mean, it's it's hairline. I mean, it's really, really fine. But I don't think it's actually going to affect the view, you know, because there's a lot more other things that's going to affect the view. But... I will say this, I see some more over here. And so I think what that is, is grinding artifacts on the mirror. So I contacted Tong through email the next day, and the following day I got a response. And I'll read that email here. I'm sorry, but unfortunately, most of our mirrors do come with hairline scratches. It is very difficult to avoid completely from large mirrors and only gets worse for larger mirrors. However, they should not have any impact on the optical performance. Most of these scratches are caused by particles and the polishing agent in the figuring stage. It is impossible to go back to the polishing stage to get rid of them. You may get new ones again. We do count and inspect the scratches for every mirror after coating and reject it if it exceeds our standards. We have been working to reduce the hairline scratches, but it will be a work in progress for some time. Thank you, Tong. It's not on the surface, it's under the coating, okay? All right, well, let's move on to the next phase and we'll get this together and we'll see how the action is on the scope. Okay, so here we have all the pieces laid out. Doesn't uh, look like a whole lot, and that's the whole idea of it. It's uh, ultra light. So the secondary housing looks pretty nice. Let's get you a closer look here. This is adjustable. It's kind of like Bob's knobs on steroids. Really nice. And then here's where the spider bolts to the uh, secondary cage. This is stainless steel. There's a nylon bushing here. And there's a lip right in here. And so the mirror, the secondary goes down in there. You open this up, it goes down in there, and then this polyester pile pushes it up and it locks it up against this rim so that it can't fall out. I really like that because gluing a secondary to a plate and then having the secondary, you know, like that, is just like, choom, and there goes your primary. So they have an actual physical barrier that prevents the secondary mirror from flopping out. So that's one of the improvements they made over the original ones. And also these bob knobs, uh, I believe, is another additional improvement. Also, the back of the secondary won't get any ambient lighting because it's in this housing.
there's something I'd like to point out here, and that is when you go to stuff the secondary mirror, what you want to be mindful of is you don't want to overstuff the secondary holder to, to the point to where you wind up binding or pinching the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror should be in there uh, snug, but it should not be pinched or bound by the secondary housing or being overstuffed with the batting that they provide you with. Now, Mike Lockwood of Lockwood Custom Optics covers the secondary installation really good. And I would suggest that you read that part on his website to get a better idea on what you're trying to accomplish when you install that secondary. My secondary housing came a little small and what I had to do in order to accommodate it, I had to enlarge it somewhat and so I put washers in between the housing and the support ring behind the screw in order to increase the circumference. So if you pinch your secondary mirror it's going to degrade the views that you're going to be getting through your telescope. Mike covers all of this and it's a good idea to go over his, to his website, uh, read the article before you attempt to put in your secondary mirror. Now I wanted to point this out because it's often an overlooked feature and that is with the UL-16, what we have here is a cell that has a moving frame. Now in this design, everything that touches the mirror is moved by the collimation bolts here, down here, and one over on the other side, which move it relative to another frame, which is this frame here. When collimation is adjusted, everything moves with the mirror. That is, you have your sling, your point supports, and the mirror all move together. In a less advanced cell, typically you would have the collimation bolts here and one over here and one down here. And so all you're moving are the triangles, but the sling and edge supports don't move with the mirror. And so what happens is the sling or the edge support becomes misaligned and the mirror can become pinched against the retaining clips, which are on the top both of which will cause star images to become distorted. Now, what I'm saying here is that this movable frame is superior to what is typically offered in these Dobsonian telescopes. It costs more to make a moving frame cell like this, but it's well worth it. So what I've done here is I put this piece of felt right here and on the opposite side and here are the alt bearings. So we're looking on the inside of the rocker box. Now the reason why I did that is because the mirror box kind of bounces back and forth here and it clangs against metal a little bit. It's a little kind of loose and um, I don't like the action or the feel of that. So what this does is just a thick piece of felt that is self-adhesive that takes up that slack and smooths that out. And it really made a big difference. And it's a simple little thing to do. So let's take a little closer look at that. So there it is there. And you can see it's about, oh, I don't know, a quarter inch thick or something. Uh, but that's with the felt. It, it'll crush down to less than that. And it did come self-stick, but I did apply some uh, Gorilla Tape on the other side. There's the Gorilla Tape right here. And this is folded over down to about right there. So that's about a quarter of an inch. And then I covered it with Gorilla Tape and came all the way down to the bottom and rolled it underneath. And that's to give it some extra support so it doesn't come undone. And I came a little bit past the edge about right about there. It's a real simple fix, but it, it keeps the mirror box from slopping around in the rocker box. So there it is with the alt bearings installed and the mirror box installed in the rocker box. And it's the same on the other side. 
and see now I'm rocking it back and forth and I don't get that banging clanging that I was getting before. Um, I should have probably photographed that first so that you could see what it prevents now but uh, when if you get a UL-16 you'll know what I'm talking about. It kind of like jostles around in there and it clangs and it's uh, I don't believe it's good. I don't like metal on metal like that. It's really a simple fix. I mean it's there's nothing to it uh, so that really helps a lot and then here you're looking at where the splice is and I don't have no hang up there. There's something I thought I'd point out here with the truss poles. Now this is the top that attaches to the secondary cage and for the F4.5 you need to be in this hole in order to reach focus. Now you might start out putting it like this and the problem if you try that is you see they won't they won't seat, it won't come together. It rides up on this part right here. These two interact. So when you go to put these together you need to have the both flat sides facing each other. So these are the flat sides like this and then they would come together like that. Now this may be obvious to some and it may not be obvious to others and by doing it this way when you spread the pole to attach it to the mirror box they flush up. It's nice and flat in between there. Here we are two weeks later and I've had the scope out twice now and the first light was your typical first light. It was kind of fussy as they always are with issues, red dot finder, trying to dial that in and trying to figure out the weight system and how to get familiar with the operation of the telescope and as and alt. So there are no big surprises there. I did find though that the contrast was pretty good considering that the moon had exchanged places with the sun so I never really got a really dark night but some of the steps I took in order to increase the contrast helped quite a bit. I put a piece of black vinyl underneath the bottom of the mirror and on both sides and that really seemed to pay off because the moon was pretty bright and when I slewed to Orion which was low in the west uh, but I figured I'd better grab it before it went too far down and yet I was getting a pretty decent view, especially considering the conditions. And Harold, you were right. I was able to see color in the Orion Nebula. So that was cool. Now on the second night, we had a much darker sky, so I was able to do a nice uh, star test, and I was pleased with the results. There were some pretty choice targets that I was able to look at with night vision. Uh, because that's pretty much what I do with visual work these days. And the structure in M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, was quite evident. You could see the dust lanes and the land bridge that connects the companion galaxy to the main galaxy, M51. And on the outer spiral arm, what looks like the Aleutian Islands. So there was lots of structure, and I was really pleased with that, because that's usually a pretty faint target. Uh, that shows up uh, in, in my 12 with a hint of structure with night vision, but with the 16, it was definitely there. So, in other words, you know, the 16 was performing what you would expect a 16 to do, but these larger apertures, 16 inches and above, they do require dark skies in order to take full advantage of their capabilities, which means that your scope has to be portable. Uh, if you have something that's too heavy, or too clumsy to get into the car and drive out to the dark site and like I said earlier you're making excuses for not to go then it's really not a good thing. Uh, I would recommend sticking with a 12 or a 10 if you're living in light pollution and you can't get out to a dark site because you're gonna probably see more or less the same. The 16 is gonna amplify the light pollution on you and requires better skies for taking full advantage of it. So those are the takeaways that I got from those two nights out. Overall, I'm really satisfied with the scope and it's been great so far. Now, as some of you know that the Hubble Space Telescope was launched aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1990. 
And although we're not at the Cape, we're here at the Delta Zero Niner missile site here in western South Dakota, a part of the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site. Now we don't have any intentions of launching a UL-16 on top of that ICBM they got down in there. It's just a static display and it doesn't fly anyway. I'm here with the Black Hills Astronomical Society to help the Park Service put on a star party for the Boy Scouts later on this evening. But before I wrap this interview up, there's a few things I'd like to go over that concerns balance. These ultra lightweights, they're a little finicky when it comes to balancing because of their light structure. And there has been some comments made that it takes a while for the scope to settle down before you're able to get to the eyepiece. Now I haven't found that to be the case, but it took some time in order to figure out the proper balance for the payload that I have on the front of it. So let's look at some options for balancing the UL-16. What I have here are three different size weights. This is a 10 pound dumbbell weight and this is a 5 pound and this is an 8 pound 15 ounce weight. Initially I started out with the 5 pound weight but this didn't work out uh, too well because my payload at the eyepiece is over four and a half pounds. Now that includes a Teleview 35 millimeter panoptic eyepiece, PBS 14 night vision, digital altitude setting circle gauge and the red dot finder and the dew shield I manufactured out of a vinyl tub. So that adds quite a bit of weight on the end of the scope. So five pounds could probably work for most conventional eyepieces and settings, but in my case it didn't. So I went up to a 10 pound, and these are available at uh, department stores or thrift stores or Craigslist or garage sales, you name it. These are all around. This worked for most of the settings, but once again, not all. And what I didn't like about this, this much weight made the movement in Altaz jerky. This was a little excessive. So I had this laying around, and as I said earlier, this is 8 pounds, 15 ounces. And I put this initially on here. So what I've done here is I put a quarter inch tap uh, drilling a hole through here and tapping it out for quarter inch thread which is what this is and initially I was putting these weights on like here and then screwing it right in like that essentially you snug it up and then you know it holds it there it suggested to use sandbags but guys I would totally stay away from sandbags or anything that has some kind of grainy matter in it because you don't want that powder or grain leaking or getting into your altitude bearings or on your mirror. You get the point. If you don't have a quarter inch tap, you could always drill a quarter inch hole and then run a machine bolt through there and secure it with a nut on the outside. Okay, like that. And that would keep that stud in place. Now, going back to the 8 pound 15 ounce counterweight. I had originally put that up here and it was working okay except when you got a low to the horizon like 30 degrees then the top the front of the daub got top heavy. Once again these ultralights all of them they're they're tricky because they're kind of light and you know that's the whole point of it but it makes it a little more challenging to find your balance. So I knew that the 10 didn't work, this didn't work, so what I came up with is I lowered the center of gravity by making this plate, and this is just a piece of uh, metal plate here, drilled with a quarter inch hole. And the weight is attached to it with a quarter inch machine bolt. And back here, I have this taped up so it doesn't scuff up the, the metal. You have a, the head of the screw, or the bolt, whatever it is. Now, you don't want that rubbing up against here or creating a problem and you might have a quarter inch nut there depending. So what I've done here, I've taken two strips of wood to raise the back of this up to create a channel so that it's not rubbing up against there and then put the handyman secret weapon duct tape on there to hold it in place. So now I have a channel so by lowering the center of gravity and I lowered it four inches from where it was up here center down here and taking a high bolt now, lowering the center of gravity gave it just the right amount to where it holds its position 
no matter where I point the daub, whether it's low, whether it's high, and it's a nice solid connection. Uh, you might find that the five pound weight just isn't really enough for you, but if you lowered it down to here, that would give you that extra advantage and it might just work out sweet. So these holes here are obviously larger than a quarter inch bolt. And what you can do is put a plug in there of some sort. I had a piece of this vinyl plug and I just put it in there and drilled out a quarter inch hole in order to allow a washer to come back on here and block that off. You could uh, take a hole saw, and uh, which is what I used here for this one, uh, in order to attach this to that with a quarter inch nut and cut a plug, put it in there and drilled a quarter inch hole through the plug. As you can see here, and I had to fatten it up a little bit with electrician's friction tape, and that's how I got that to uh, stay there and snug it up that way. It also doesn't interfere with your truss poles and your shroud. Your shroud would go here like that. Uh, your truss poles go here like that, and the shroud just comes right up to it, so it doesn't interfere with that. It's nice and solid. It doesn't rattle. It doesn't rock. It doesn't roll. Well, we're at the Hidden Valley Observatory run by the Black Hills Astronomical Society in Western South Dakota, just to demonstrate some of those positions that it will hold when you have it properly balanced. So I've got the DAB at 34.3 uh, degrees, and you can see it holds that position with the four and a half pound plus package on the front. When you balance it properly, it has no problem holding multiple positions. Uh, let's move to another position. And now I've got it at 14.1, and it holds that. You can see if it was moving, that digital gauge would be moving. It's a little breezy out here today, and that's what you just saw that thing move, because we got a little bit of vibration from the breeze, but otherwise it's holding nice and steady. We'll drop it down a little bit more. Okay, so there we are at 7.4. And I doubt you'd be looking at anything that low in the horizon. You'd be totally in the soup and you wouldn't be seeing much at all. But that just demonstrates what it can do when it's properly balanced. I'm going to pull back so you can see what the whole package looks like here. Okay, so here we've got the whole daub, the UL16, and it's at 7.4 degrees. And that's really low. I mean, so it's not dropping down with over four and a half pounds of weight here and I'm going to raise it up um, so right there we have a 64.9 degrees call it 65 degrees and we still hold it in position so in multiple positions there's no problem they're a little tricky to balance these out but it's doable. You just got to experiment with it and then sooner or later you'll get the weight combinations you need. One last tip. I find that the best way to move these around is grabbing them at two points. And typically what I do is I grab it here right by the eyepiece and then down here by the other knob or up here by this upper knob. So using two hands and then I move it slowly like that into position and I'm looking at my setting circles and this is about how I turn it about like this so you want to keep it kind of nice and smooth and you don't want to get jerky with these or pull them and primarily because you'll you could knock it out of collimation if you start you know whipping them around you know doing this kind of thing you're gonna, you're gonna knock it out of collimation now I know a lot of you guys are real careful with your equipment and that's a good thing, but you guys that are new to the hobby, that are not uh, totally familiar with these daubs, uh, especially with these truss daubs and most especially with the ultralights, you want to kind of like hold them down with two hands like that up the top. Avoid grabbing them by the truss poles because you're going to tend to maybe jerk the pole out and it's better not to just pull it with one hand because it gets kind of jerky, you see that? So if you've got two hands on there, you can get a good feel for it, and you can move it around nice and smooth. So it's a two-hand position up here by the secondary cage. 
Okay, that wraps up this review of the Hubble Optics UL-16 Dobsonian Mounted Telescope. If you like what you saw here today, give us a thumbs up. You know, we appreciate that. Or subscribe. I've got some other videos coming up, uh, like a follow-up on this. The UL-16 making it even better. So keep abreast of the latest developments that are happening here on Dakota Starry Nights. Until next time, clear skies.